Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on Smithsonian Science How. We are behind the scenes at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History with botanist Dr. Eric Schupeltz. Eric, thank you so much for having us in your lab and office space. Thanks. So Eric, can you start off by telling our viewers a little bit about what you do as a botanist here at the Smithsonian? Well, as a botanist here, I, I do quite a, quite a few different things. Um, I, I spend a little bit of time uh, working in a lab. Um, I spend a lot of time sitting in front of my computer, <laughs> analyzing data, <laughs> reading papers, writing papers. Um, I'm fortunate that I get to spend quite a bit of time in the field, um, collecting plants, collecting specimens. Um, and I spend a fair bit of time um, right behind us in, in, in the herbarium, um, in the collection, uh, working working with those collections um, and collections from the past. You actually showed our team the herbarium earlier this week where you store all of those mm -hmm. plant collections and we took a video of it so that our viewers today can take a look too. Great. Let's take a look. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us behind the scenes here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. We're joined by Dr. Eric Schupeltz, a botanist here at the museum. Eric, thank you so much for inviting us into the botany collection. It's great to have you here. This is the United States National Herbarium. Um, it contains about 5 million plant specimens that have been collected, flattened out, uh, dried, and then mounted on, on paper and are filed away in these cabinets. How do you use the National Herbarium in your work? I'm a pteridologist, would be the name, a scientist who studies ferns. Um, and I use specimens um, in, in nearly all of my work. Um, specimens provide us with information about obviously how the plants look, uh, their microscopic features, um, and it can also provide material for um, DNA-based analyses as well. Our fern herbarium, uh, which we're standing in the middle of, it contains about a qu quarter of a million uh, specimens. They're stored um, dry, uh, of course, that's the most important feature, um, and these dried specimens will last hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, our oldest collection, I think, in the, uh, in the entire herbarium is from the 1500s. Uh, uh, they were arranged um, taxonomically, uh, phylogenetically, in terms of how they're related to one another. Of course, many folks are going to be, be familiar with ferns as understory plants. Here's an example of a, of a maidenhair fern um, that could be growing on the forest floor um, somewhere. I've also uh, grabbed a, a variety of, uh, of tropical ferns. This fern has simple leaves. Um, you might mistake it as, as, as a grass, even from, from a distance. And I would never think that's a fern or that, like you said. So Eric, you work here in, in the National Herbarium. You focus on ferns. What's the big question that you're researching? I'm interested fundamentally in where this diversity came from. Why do we see so many forms? Why do we see so many species of ferns on our planet today? And, and what are the characteristics of these ferns that that have made them successful. People generally don't think of ferns as, as being super important or even super diverse. I would imagine that, that, that some folks are surprised that there are even six different kinds of ferns. Um, but in fact, there are about 10,000 species, um, which puts them in the same ballpark as the number of species of birds and, and many more species than there are of a group like mammals. Wow, that's so fascinating. Thank you for giving us a short introduction to the National Herbarium. Of course. Eric, thank you so much for showing us the herbarium, and it was just so cool to see cabinets upon cabinets of all of these pressed plants and ferns specifically. Now, coming from Pennsylvania, I was used to seeing ferns in kind of the damp areas, kind of dark areas of forests, but that's not the same kind of habitat that they occupy worldwide, is it? Not, not everywhere. Uh, here in, 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 in other temperate areas of the, of the world, um, ferns are most common as, un, as understory plants, um, you know, growing in shady areas. Um, but in drier parts of the world, for example, the, uh, the southwest of the United States um, in the deserts, um, ferns might be tucked into little rock crevices. Um, you've, you've got an image, uh, hopefully, that's showing um, of, of, of that. So a little, little fern in a, in a desert. Um, in the tropics, um, of course, ferns are growing in the understory. Um, they're also growing in those rock crevices. Um, but about a third of, of all fern species actually grows epiphytes. Um, this means that they grow on other, on other plants. And, and, and there you have an example of a small epiphytic fern growing on the side of a, of a tree. Um, and, and so although ferns are, are distributed uh, globally, really they're found on every continent except for Antarctica, um, it's really the tropics uh, where they really come to life. Where we see here, highlighted. Exactly. Um, so thanks for giving us an introduction to ferns. Uh, we have a student question and it comes in by video. Okay. So let's listen. to know how many species of ferns are there throughout the world and which is your favorite? 
Thanks, Carolina, for that question. Um, there are about 10,500, give or take, uh, species of ferns on, on, our, on our planet, which is, which is quite, a, quite a few. Uh, I think, like I said, about, about the same number as bird species. Um, as far as picking my favorite, that's really hard for me to do. Um, it's even hard for me to pick my favorite group of ferns. Um, but it's really those, those epiphytes, I guess, that, that ultimately got me really excited about fern diversity, those, those ferns that grow on other plants. Now, um, you mentioned that there is a huge amount of fern diversity, uh, but I know that you're specifically interested in islands. What do fern populations look like on islands? So islands are really incredible places um, to look for ferns. Um, and, and this is because ferns tend to be overrepresented on islands. If, if we think globally, the, the sort of worldwide picture, um, ferns are about 10,000 species of about 300,000 total species of plants. So they're about 3% of, of total global species diversity. Um, but in an island, um, in the oceanic islands specifically, that number can be much, much greater. If we think of the uh, Hawaiian islands as an example, about 15% of, of the species on, on Hawaii are ferns. So, so quite, a, quite a few more. Um, and, and I'm really interested in, in trying to figure out why um, ferns have been so successful on oceanic islands. And that's your big research question then. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of them. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Which we yeah. see right here. What features of ferns make them so successful on islands? And you recently traveled to a chain of islands, the Marquesas Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell our viewers where that is and why that is a great place to study this research question? So the Marquesas Islands are, are very isolated. Um, they are pretty well, pretty much smack dab in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the South Pacific Ocean. Um, you can see on the map there that they are, they're really in the middle of the ocean. The closest <laughs> continent actually is is North America, um, but it's it's over 5,000 um, kilometers away. Um, and that extreme isolation really um, leads to extreme overrepresentation. Um, so again. Thinking globally, 3%, Hawaii, 15%. On the Marquesas, about 30% of, of, of the species diversity that are, that are native to the Marquesas are ferns. And so for you, somebody who studies ferns, that must be like a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 I sort of think of, of these islands as, as, as a, these, these rocky outcrops in, in the middle of the Pacific as, as fundamentally being a five million year old experiment um, of, of dispersal and establishment and really sort of a natural lab um, that will hopefully provide some insight into, into why ferns have been successful on not only those islands, but islands as a whole and, and possibly even why ferns have been successful as they are on a global scale. So what's it like working in such a remote location like the Marquesas? Well, as you might imagine, um, it, an island in the middle of the South Pacific is an incredibly beautiful place to work. Um, the landscapes, as we you see as it here, it's are gorgeous. really, really spectacular. Um, and as a pteridologist, again, again, somebody who studies ferns, um, it's, re it's really neat to be in a place um, where one third of, of the species are your study organism. Um, you know, I'm used to going uh, to places where it's, you know, 3% of the, of the diversity. So that's really pretty incredible. Um, but as you might imagine, being so isolated, there are also some challenges. Um, it's, it's not exactly easy to get there. Um, it's not very easy to get between the islands necessarily. Um, and all of these islands have relatively low populations um, of, of people. Um, each of the islands we visited only had, or was only home to about 5,000 um, people. And so some of the things that we might take for granted here in a, in a big city or even a, or in a small town in the continental US, um, some of those things that we take for granted just simply aren't available. Um, as, as an example, um, I read the newspaper on my computer or on my phone. Me too. Um, yeah, as, as, do, as do many people. And, and it seems uh, it, the same is true for the folks that are living on the Marquesas. But given that they're on an island, if they're all reading the, uh, the newspaper on their computer or their phone, there was, there was no need to fly newspapers, um, as it turns out, um, for sale um, in, in the Marquesas. And, and I can personally live without um, being connected to the world for a couple of weeks. It's, <laughs> it's kind of nice. It's something about field work I look forward <laughs> to. Um, but from a processing or a specimen collecting standpoint, it actually poses some problems because the way that we, the way that we press our plants is between newspaper. And, and that's something that we don't bother carrying with us in the field because usually it's available everywhere. So that came as a little bit of a, of a surprise and, and involved a little bit of scrambling to, to fly in some newspaper from Tahiti, which is, which is about 1,500 kilometers away. That had to be a really expensive <laughs> paper delivery. 
Yeah, that was <laughs> very expensive paper <laughs> delivery indeed. Yeah. So thanks for giving us a little bit of an overview about your research and um, what fern diversity looks like on islands and in the tropics. Um, but let's take a step back and actually learn about what a fern is. Great. And before you tell us, I think it's a great opportunity to check in with our viewers. Super. So viewers, here's an opportunity for you to tell us what you think. Uh, we're going to do a live poll. You can respond using the window that appears to the right of your video screen. Tell us, what do all ferns have in common? Is it leaves, flowers, seeds, or spores? Take a moment to think about it and put your response in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. This is the same place that you can post questions for Dr. Eric Schupeltz to answer during our live broadcast today. We also have another botany expert, uh, Greg McKee, who is in the chat answering questions as well. Eric, we're looking over my shoulder at the results coming in, and 73% of our viewers say that they have spores. That is that is a really good answer. Um, I, I think that the best definition um, for ferns, though, is, is actually uh, combining something that they have and something that they don't have. Um, ferns are plants that have true leaves, um, but that don't have seeds. And, and if they don't have seeds, they also don't have flowers. So what is it about the spores? So, so the spores are, are also a characteristic of ferns, um, but it turns out spores are, are characteristic of all plants. All plants um, produce spores. Um, the, the reason we don't think of all plants as producing spores is because in seed plants, uh, the plants that we're, that we're often most familiar with, the spores that are, that are produced never leave the plant. Um, they, they either never leave or they, or they turn into, or they grow into something else before they, before they leave. In seed plant, or seed free plants, um, like ferns, um, the spores are dispersed. Yeah. So dispersal. Um, oh, actually right here we have, are these spores that we're looking at? So, so yeah, these are, these are SEM um, images of, of some spores. Um, you can see that the ornamentation of these spores is really incredible. And these are really small. Uh, those, those scale bars there are just 10 microns. So, so the spores themselves are about 50 microns across, um, which is about a 20th of, uh, I'm sorry, no, I, the 20th of a millimeter? Yes, yeah. I'm, <laughs> They're very small. Yes, very small. Yeah, <laughs> maybe smaller, five, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these spores are meant to be dispersed. And dispersal is that kind of like when you pick a dandelion and you blow on it and those seeds go flying away. In the wind? That's, ex that's exactly what uh, dispersal is. In the case of a dandelion, um, those fruits um, with, with the seeds inside um, are, are dispersed and, and seed plants, uh, of course, are either dispersing their seeds or in the case of, of flowering plants might actually um, disperse the fruits with the seeds in, inside. Um, and inside, buried in, inside each and every one of those seeds um, is a tiny little version, a multicellular um, version, but, but small, of, of, the, of the larger plant. So if you think of an acorn uh, or an oak tree uh, producing acorns, inside that acorn is, is a little tiny version of an oak tree that's ready to go. Um, when that seed hits the ground, it can germinate and, and a new oak tree takes its place. And, and seeds and fruits um, can be dispersed in a wide variety of ways. They can simply just fall to the ground around um, with, with gravity sort of pulling them uh, to, to the place. They can be forcefully ejected from the plants in some cases. Um, they can be carried away by wind or by water. Um, or in many cases, they, they are collected and then carried to far off places by animals. Interesting. So which is it for ferns? Actually, don't tell us. Let's yeah. check in with our viewers again. Viewers, here's another opportunity for a live poll. Tell us, how are fern spores dispersed? Is it water, wind? animals or gravity. Take a moment to think about it and put your response in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. You may need to minimize your window to respond. So 
Our responses are still coming in, but it looks like most of our viewers, 67%, think that it is wind. That's that's actually a, an excellent answer. Um, if you look at the uh, the underside of a of a, of a piece of fern. I've, I've got a, a small a small piece of leaf here. Um, if, you, if you look at the underside of this, you may have noticed that there are spots or, or lines. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put this under the, the microscope, under the stereoscope, so you can see um, some of these dots in this case. And uh, there they are. There they are. And if I zoom in on those um, and focus, you can see that those are actually made up of smaller um, things. And, the, and those smaller things um, that you're seeing are, are sporangia. Um, and that sporangia on the undersurface of most fern leaves are what makes the spores. That's where the spores are made. Um, and in most ferns, uh, the spores simply don't just fall out of, of, these, of these sporangia, um, but they're actually thrown out. They're, they're physically forced out of, of, of the sporangia. And here we have a, a video that's, that's looping, and this is real time, right? So, so this sporangium is splitting open, it's pulling back that charge of spores and then literally throwing it uh, or throwing, throwing them um, into the air, which is, which is pretty neat to see. Um, and, and, and so all of this though is happening on a very small scale, right? I, I zoomed in on the microscope, showed you how small these things are. Um, this is not throwing them long distances. This is just simply throwing them a little bit um, further away from the leaf. And it's really wind, uh, like, the re like the response has suggested, um, that's doing most of the work. Wind is really what's carrying um, the spores away from the plant. So the sporangia, that um, piece on the underside of a fern leaf mm -hmm. is actually throwing these spores out and it's then getting picked up by the wind. Exactly. Do you have any spores here to help us understand the scale of what we're talking about? I, I do I do have a, a, a small container of some turidophyte spores um, and, and, and this is this is effectively, it, it looks like flower, it's, it looks like dust. Um, and if I shoot some into the air, up oh, there it is. You can see they just sort of hang out right Thank where you. they are. They float up, they float down. The slightest little bit of into my nose, into all yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll breathe in them. Um, they're super small, they're super light, um, and they can really be carried anywhere um, by the slightest of breeze. And if you think about you know a windstorm, um, they can really be carried around the, around the globe. All right, so let's get back to these spores. So like the dandelion fruit, do these spores um, get dispersed and then grow into a new plant? They do grow into a new plant, um, but they don't grow into the sporophyte, the spore producing plant that we're used to seeing um, for, for ferns. Um, instead, they grow into something that we call the gametophyte, um, which, is, which is quite a bit smaller. And again, I'll, I'll, I've, got a, a small, I've got a small petri dish here with some gametophytes actually growing inside. Um, let's put those under the uh, scope as well and focus in. I can see your screen, there they are. You can see that these things are, are rather small, um, but they are green, which means they're, they're photosynthesizing, they're making food like most plants do. Um, they're also multicellular, there are, there are many, many cells um, involved. They're just, they're just much, much smaller um, than, than the stage of the fern life cycle that we're used to seeing. And what are we looking at here? So this is, this is another um, example of a gametophyte, in this case, growing in the wild. Um, and, and we typically think of the, the sort of stereotypical fern gametophyte as being this sort of little heart-shaped thallus, a little flat mass of cells that, that takes on a little bit of a heart shape. So the gametophyte, is that like a baby fern? It's, it's not itself really a baby fern because in, in some cases, well, once these things are mature and the, and the ones that, that I was showing you under the, uh, under the microscope as well as the, uh, the one that you just saw in the image, um, those are mature gametophytes. Um, they've, they've served, that's, that's as big as they will grow and at that stage, um, they are they're producing um, gametes. That's where the, the term gametophyte comes from. That's the gamete producing uh, stage of, of the fern life cycle. Um, and, and so I've, I've made a little bit of a, of a model here out of, out of Legos to sort of walk us through um, what's, what's happening um, in this life cycle. So here we have the sort of typical um, fern that you, would, that you would think of maybe growing in a basket or which you could find on the forest floor. Um, this, as you recall, has sori on the backside. The sori are made up of sporangia. The sporangia are gonna produce spores. And they eject those spores out. Literally throwing them away from the, uh, from the plant where they'd be taken away. Um, in the wind, those spores are going to grow into gametophytes, 
right? And these gametophytes then are going to produce the sperm and the egg. Um, and in ferns, the sperm are actually swimming. Uh, they swim through water. Uh, they have flagella, uh, just like animal sperm do. Um, they would find their way to an egg cell. Uh, fertilization would occur. Um, at that point, you'd have a zygote. And it's that zygote then um, that grows into a young sporophyte. And eventually, that young sporophyte will grow into the mature sporophyte. And, and the life cycle continues. So how fascinating. In fern life cycle, there are actually two stages and they are completely separate and exactly. they can live independently of, from one another. Exactly. We have another question. This one comes from Sad. Why are ferns poisonous? Ferns are poisonous uh, because they, they produce a lot of um, a, a ver wide variety of chemical compounds um, that, that can be toxic to, to vertebrates, um, in, in some cases toxic to, to insects, um, and, and in part that's a defense mechanism. Um, of course, some of some of them just happen to be toxic, um, but in but in many cases, they're a defense mechanism to prevent herbivory. Yeah. Wonderful, great questions. Keep them coming. So let's get back to your research question. Mm -hmm. You're really interested in why ferns are so successful on islands. What does the fern life cycle have to do with your research question? Well, I, I think that ultimately um, the success of, of ferns um, comes down to the, in part to the fact that, that spore dispersal brings with it so many um, big advantages. It, it, these tiny little propagules can be carried off to far away places um, much e more easily um, in many cases than seeds or fruits. Um, this life cycle, though, that we talked about would seem to also pose some disadvantages. Um, but as it turns out, uh, ferns have, have often been able to overcome some of these different uh, disadvantages through the flexibility that they have in their life cycle. What do you mean by flexibility? Well, the, uh, the typical situation in ferns, like, like I talked about, involve two spores and two gametophytes. So one spore would develop into one gametophyte, another spore developing into the second gametophyte, one gametophyte producing sperm, the other producing eggs to complete its life cycle. Um, but this doesn't always have to happen like that. Um, in some cases, and in many ferns in fact, one spore can divide to form one gametophyte that produces both eggs and sperm, and fertilization can happen within that, that individual um, gametophyte. Um, in many ferns, this is facilitated by the presence of a phenomenon which we refer to as polyploidy, which is simply the presence of multiple sets of chromosomes. And those multiple sets of chromosomes within each and every cell um, ultimately bring greater genetic diversity to the table um, so that cell fertilization um, within that gametophyte um, might actually result in a viable um, sporophyte. So fascinating. So that flexibility and the genetic diversity mm -hmm. that they have and this um, wind dispersal to be able to bring these spores from maybe even mainland to hundreds, thousands of miles away to islands all contribute to their success. Exactly. I, it's, it's really, I think, the spore dispersal as well as this flexibility um, in, the, in their life cycle that, that, that come together um, to contribute to their success on, on islands um, and, and quite likely their, their success um, across, across the globe. Um, by studying the, the ferns of the Marquesas in, in detail, um, I, I hope to better understand what's, what's actually happening um, in that island system to understand which of these um, things, whether it be the flexibility of their life cycle, the long distance dispersal, some combination of each, to really better understand the impact of each so I can better understand what's going on on those islands, oceanic islands as a whole, and, and ultimately the globe. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for telling us about your research here at the Smithsonian, how you're studying that question, and giving us an overview of the fern's flexible life cycle. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Thanks for having me. Let's get to some student questions. Sounds great. This question comes from Jason. Jason wants to know, can an ecosystem continue without ferns, and how long, if so? That's a really hard question to, uh, to answer. Um, Certainly, in most cases, ferns are, are not the dominant features of, of an ecosystem, although, although they can, in some cases, be the dominant plants. Um, in those situations where they're not dominant, um, one could certainly imagine that the ecosystem could continue without it, um, but it's likely that other species would also become locally extinct that, that would depend on ferns. We have another video question. Okay. Let's listen. Great. How long have ferns been around? 
Thanks, Inigo, for that question. Ferns have been around a really long time. Uh, we know from the fossil record as well as from estimates uh, based on uh, DNA sequence data um, that ferns have been around since the Devonian, um, which is about 400 million years ago. Um, so this is a really, really old lineage. Um, but the really cool thing about, uh, about ferns is that even though this is really old lineage, most of the species um, that are on our planet today are actually very young. So this question um, comes in from Nusa. Uh, do ferns make their food with photosynthesis? Yes, exactly. Uh, ferns, um, like all plants, um, photosynthesize um, and, and, and use light um, to, make, to make sugar, um, and, that's, and that's their food. Yes. We have another question from Indigo by okay. video. Okay, from Indigo, great. How big was the biggest fern ever recorded? The biggest fern ever recorded. Um, today, uh, the largest ferns that, that live on our planet um, are members of what we call the tree ferns. And as the name suggests, um, these things are very tree-like. Um, they have trunks. Um, in many cases, those trunks can reach upwards of 20 meters um, or 60 feet in height. Um, it's possible that, uh, that some ferns or things that we would call ferns um, from, the, from the Devonian period or the Carboniferous um, may be even bigger than that. So those tree ferns, do they make wood? They do not make wood. Um, only seed plants are, are, are able to make wood. So this one comes in from a guest. Um, are there microscopic ferns? There are in the there are microscopic ferns in the sense that you know there there are ferns that would be very difficult to see without without a microscope. Um, the gametophytes, for example, of most ferns are pretty small. Um, some could be as large as as large as your sort of pinky fingernail. Um, others can be even bigger than that, but but others might be might be much smaller. Um, in terms of the smallest sporophytes. Um, the sort of more typical life stage that, you, that you're used to seeing. Um, the smallest sporophytes are, are also probably about the size of a, of a pinky fingernail. Can you find, a, can I find a gametophyte if I went out and I looked in the right place? Absolutely, and, and, I, and I would encourage folks to, to get out there and, and see if they can't find some gametophytes. Uh, you probably want a flashlight, you probably want a magnifying glass, and the best place to look is, is, a, is a dark um, soil bank. Um, in, in, in a forest, especially in, in, in a temperate area. Uh, we have another question about um, what they look like. So what colors are ferns? So most ferns um, as, as that you're familiar with are green. They come in every lovely shade of green imaginable. <laughs> um, but, in, but in some cases, the youngest leaves um, are, are actually very brilliant red um, in, in color. And this happens in a, in a number of groups. Um, and they're really quite, quite lovely, as you saw in that image that just came across. So Evie has another question. She wants to know, can animals eat ferns? And if so, which animals? So the, the most common um, animals that are, that are eating ferns are, are insects. Um, there are some insects that are generalists and eat a lot of plants and eat ferns as one of those. Um, and there are also some insects that are specialists that, that only eat ferns. Wonderful. Eric, thank you so much for answering these questions oh, and course. for teaching us about ferns today. Thanks for tuning in today to learn about ferns with Dr. Eric Schupelt. And we hope to see you next time on Smithsonian Science How. Thank you.